David Engels is professor at Free University of Brussels. Professor Dr. Engels is chair of Roman history at the University of Brussels and currently works at research as research professor at the Institute Zachodny in Poznan, Poland. Uder and editor of numerous scholarly books and papers on ancient history, reception history and philosophy of history and modern conservatism. He is chiefly known through his study Lodichlien, where he compared the crisis to the EU, to the decline and fall of the Roman Republic in the first century BC, and through his books Renovatio Europe and Vastun, all published in numerous translations. Professor Engels is going to give us some comparative perspectives on late civilizations and mass migration. I hope that the sound is now okay. I just had some trouble with my with my headset. Can you confirm that you can hear me fine? Hello. What? Can you can you Hello? Hello. The voice is perfect. OK, that is fine. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for, for inviting me to this, uh, what promises to be a, a fascinating conference. I'm really looking forward to the discussion, to the panel, to the other contributors. And uh, I will uh, present myself uh, um, some reflections. Um, on uh, the on mass migration from um, a historical point of view, uh, from 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 a, the point of view of a historical uh, comparatist, the current mass migration to Europe may seem spectacular and preoccupying in many respects. And indeed, we are faced with the most enormous threat to the European identity Europe has been facing since the Spanish Reconquista and the Ottoman Wars. However, this evolution uh, is neither the exclusive result of any form of real or alleged climate change, nor new from a world historical point of view, rather to the contrary. All civilizations, independent of their technological level, are victims of mass migration once they reach the final stage of their respective evolution and see sooner or later their traditional ethnic identity and social cohesion in danger. Let me be very clear from the beginning. In contrast to many of my colleagues, I do not see in the fact that certain evolutions already happened numerous times throughout world history, a reason for minimizing their impact and gravity or to appeal to inertia or resignation. To the contrary, I would like to use these examples to underline the fact that while we cannot entirely change the general course of the history of civilizations, we very well possess a certain margin of action which we can use to our benefit. Let us have a look at a series of chosen examples. The most well-known example comes, of course, from classical antiquity. I'm sure that many of you expect that I will point to the migration of the peoples during, um, during last uh, late antiquity, when entire tribes moved from the Germanic regions into the Roman Empire and slowly but steadily destroyed its institutions and infrastructure while constituting kingdoms of their own, which in the end led to the fragmentation and dismantling of the Roman Empire, at least in the West. However, tempting as it is, this is not the most important parallel to the present situation in my eyes. As some of you may know, thanks to my book uh, on the path towards empire, also translated into the Hungarian language, I rather parallelize modern Europe with the later Roman Republic in the first century BC, whose situation seems morphologically much more akin to our own period. Thus, already during the Republic, Rome became the point of convergence of large masses of people, essentially from the east of the Mediterranean, who wanted to benefit from the numerous possibilities offered by the new Italian megalopolis. 
The uh, number of immigrants from Syria, Asia Minor, Mesopotamia and Judea reached such a degree that the question whether or not to expel them all from Italy became a debated subject for many years, dividing those believing in stoic cosmopolitanism and those wanting to guarantee the cultural and ethnic homogeneity and solidarity of the Roman people. In the end, the flux of migrants became too large to be controlled, also because of the many prisoners and slaves imported to Rome and gaining sooner or later the liberty, so that Rome gradually became a multicultural city in which the Romans themselves started to feel in the minority. The only possible solution was implemented by the Emperor Augustus, whose legislation tried to combine natalist politics with the drastic reduction of granting civic rights to immigrants and the establishment of a new leading culture that made it possible for ambitious migrants to become full part of the Roman society, but only when they assimilated themselves to the Roman way of life. This integration functioned fairly well for many decades, and even the opening of the army for auxiliary forces from the periphery of the empire was to become a strong cement for the cultural cohesion of the empire. However, once Rome started to allow the influx of migrant groups from outside the empire too, and what is more, accepted that they settled as groups under their own laws instead of being scattered throughout the entire realm, the situation got out of hand and ultimately led to the Germanic takeover of the Roman army and the foundation of barbarian kingdoms on Roman soil. But of course, classical antiquity is not the only civilization living through a similar experience of ethnic fragmentation and difficult cultural reconstitution. We could say that virtually all other civilizations went through similar episodes. We could, for example, refer to the ancient civilization of Sumer, whose sedentary society came increasingly under threat from nomadic Amorite people, which not only seeped in from the desert fringes, but also from the Mesopotamian north. Already prior to this, the Sumerians had established a cultural symbiosis with the Semitic Akkadians, who had become an integral part of Sumerian society. The Amorites, however, proved less easy to integrate. Thus, for many decades, they established their dwellings amidst the Sumerians and brought with them their cult, their language, their traditions, and were increasingly perceived as a menace. So that in the end, the Sumerians, unified under the third dynasty of Ur, had to build enormous walls in order to protect their territory from the immigrants. Nevertheless, in the end, they overcome Sumer from within and without and founded their own dynasties, trying to establish a cultural fusion between their own traditions and their host civilization, but nevertheless, of course, being in control of power. A similar evolution is known from Pharaonic Egypt. Here, it was the Libyans from the Western Desert and the numerous Canaanite peoples from the East uh, who gradually established themselves in the Delta region, partly as prisoners of war, partly as mercenaries, partly as mer immigrants. Initially, they were met with a certain form of hostility from contemporary writers and obviously also the Egyptian people, even more so as their numeric importance steadily grew and as they kept, despite the superficial Egyptianization, their language, customs, and gods. This fragile equilibrium started to tip at the end of the Ramesside dynasty, when the Libyans finally took over the state and started to found their own dynasties. Ironically, it was the Kushites, a strongly Egyptianized people from the southern Nile region who had been long despised by the Egyptians, who rose in defense of the Egyptian civilization and its gods and liberated the Nile Valley from its Libyan overlords, only to be overthrown shortly afterwards by the Assyrians and many further conquerors. Another example of large-scale immigration comes from ancient China, where the different kingdoms from the Waring States period had to deal with the uneasy relationships with their northern nomadic neighbors from the Mongolian steppes, the Hu people. For centuries, life in the north was dominated not only by mutual attacks and the building of great walls, but also the slow seeping in from nomads into the Chinese kingdoms and, after the establishment of the sole rule of Qin Shi Huangdi, of the empire. Down the nomads very quickly took over central parts of Chinese civilization, while on the other hand they also strongly influenced China itself, both groups remained distinct from one another. And in the end, after the breakdown of the Han Empire, 
The revolt of the five barbarians led to the fragmentation of China into 16 contending principalities. In the same spirit, let us also refer to the situation in the late classical Islamic world. Here, it was the Turks from Central Asia who gradually penetrated the Muslim civilizational space. At the beginning, they were recruited as mercenaries and slaves, but already under the Abbasids, their political importance grew as they started to control central military and administrative offices and, in the end, even transformed the caliph into a mer puppet. This political takeover paved the way to a large-scale immigration of entire population groups from Central Asia into the Muslim core provinces. And though they readily adopted Islam and its civilization, they kept their own language and customs and started to create their own independent states. Of these, the Seljuks were certainly the first and the most impressive, but even where the Turks had no population majority, such as in Egypt, they managed to get control over the state through their involvement in the army, as was the case with the Mamluks. One of these Turk states implanted in Western Asia Minor finally became the core of the later Ottoman Empire and created an empire that was to encompass most of the Muslim civilizational space. We could enumerate many further examples, such as the probable responsibility of Indo-Aryan migrants for the end of the Harappa civilization, the importance of Central Asian nomad immigration for the Indian subcontinent since the Kushan period, or the impact of the Manchus on the declining Ming dynasty in Buddhist China. But the general outline of the argument would be largely the same as already sketched above. Let us thus hazard some conclusions. First, let us state once again that mass migration or mass immigration is not a new phenomenon. All late civilizations have to face this evolution. Why is this happening towards the end of a civilization? While in earlier times we either see no similar mass immigration or when it occurs, it quickly leads to a large cultural fusion between the newcomers and the people already present, such as in the case of the early medieval Normans or the Hungarians. This is a difficult question that cannot be extensively answered here. Let it suffice to hazard the hypothesis that early societies still possess an identity that is at the same time strong and flexible and makes it possible to quickly integrate, even assimilate newcomers, while older civilizations seem largely paralyzed in an identity that is merely a formal outer grid, largely devoid of inner meaning or civilizational strength. Concerning climate, there's a lot to be said from a comparative point of view, though the study of climate evolution is still in its infancy. However, what emerges already now from our evidence is that all late civilizations tend to overexploit their own environment and not only generate phases of strong population growth, but also trigger through monocultures and the disruption of natural equilibria, occasional scarcities and making the spreading of pandemics even easier. Nevertheless, this concerns essentially their own civilizational space, not the outside world. And mass immigration seems not to be the result of any major outside disruption, but rather of the attraction of the highly developed and fertile space developed within the boundaries of these late civilizations. Of course, already this attraction together with the impact of export goods easing the life of people outside, can constitute a factor of this equilibrium, usually provoking a demographic growth, mismatching production conditions and thus paving the way towards mass migration. In short, what attracts migration is not climate change, but the clash between late civilizations on the one hand and civilizationally less competitive spaces around. Furthermore, we can clearly establish that mass immigration is indeed a threat to the long-term political and cultural survival of a civilization, and that the dream of a multicultural society has never been and will probably also never be realized in actual practice. This does not exclude, of course, phenomena of mutual cultural appropriation between the autochthonous people and the newcomers. However, in the long run, Despite this acculturation, both remain distinct political and cultural units, 
so that sooner or later the question arises as to who will exert the real political power. This question is usually settled in favor of the new immigrant groups who are driven sometimes by archaic vital energy, sometimes also by the power of a resentment against the dominating civilization built up for decades, even centuries. Also, given the inherent pacifism of the autochthonous groups, migrant populations are usually disproportionately overrepresented in army and police forces, and thus tend sooner or later to capitalize on this near monopoly on organized violence. However, and this leads us to our, our, our fourth point, it is also notable that this takeover usually does not lead to a fundamental and definitive destruction of the cultural heritage of the host civilization. To the contrary, the migrants groups have, on the one hand, become so accultured and the host civilization so imposing and time honored that the new overlords generally rather present themselves as defenders of the civilization they conquer rather than as their enemies. Of course, their rule is accompanied by a slow cultural shift in favor of the new barbarian elements and a steady simplification and decline of the old civilization. However, this revolution can take a very long time and it is significant that many contemporaries do not even seem to notice it. What lessons can be drawn from this comparison for the present situation of the West? First, as has already been said, mass migration is indeed a danger for each and every society. And though it seems an unavoidable symptom of late civilizations, patriotic politicians should tend to reduce it as much as possible. Most of all, where it is still possible to maintain islands of autochthonous Western civilization, such as in the Visigoth states. Another point is the need to impose as soon and as completely as possible, a clear civilizational framework to which all those wanting to participate in the host society must adapt in order to favor integration and assimilation. The stronger this is implemented, the easier it will become for the West to survive the unavoidable tensions between migrants and autochthonous people. This necessity concerns, of course, mostly Western Europe, where the current multicultural and globalist ideology can be considered as ultimately leading to the suicide of the old European identity. Without a radical turn towards a new patriotism based on our shared Western identity and our Christian roots, it will be impossible to create such a framework while the appeal for more laicity is a dead end that actually fortifies extremism and parallel societies. A last crucial lesson is the need to avoid as much as possible the error to confide the armed, armed defense of a society to migrant groups. As history is full of examples where such a move led sooner or later to the military takeover of the army and thus of foreign cultural groups. This too is a lesson that may already come too late for many Western European societies where the army and the police are already largely staffed by foreigners. All this, of course, is no remedy for the simple fact that the West is a spent and old civilization, which can only hope at best to stabilize its decline and compensate for its growing cultural sterility by the endeavor to care for its past greatness. However, Creating the right cultural framework in order to fortify the Western identity while permitting the slow and gradual integration of migrants is probably the only solution to shape a general civilizational and social framework through which the values, the culture and the spirit of the West can be passed over to as many future generations as possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Kanta Kumari Rigo is leading by